round two, uh, I'm playing against FM Eric Lee. And uh, Eric already has the rating of a of an international master. In fact, I think he was like even <laughs> even higher rated than me for for this game. Um, and yeah, so I decided to play e4, which I have played before. I mean, I'm mainly a, a d4 player or knight f3 player, like 99% of my games. Um, every once in a while, I'll play e4, and um, I decided to play this one for a couple of reasons, actually. I noticed that, uh, number one, Eric is mainly a knight orf player, so I thought that might be fun to play into into the knight orf, and... You know, I've always been quite quite fond of the uh, the H three system, so I really um, was looking forward to uh, to playing that one. Um, but I also noticed that Eric had been playing lots of other stuff as well. Like he played the Karo Khan in a couple of games, um, and then he played lots of different sidelines within um, E four E five. Um, so here, for example, he played. Uh, I think he played the Schliemann in, in a game or two. He played. Um, some version of oh yeah he played like some g6 systems maybe like a6 first and then g6 stuff like this and um also played like some other some other ruis like with um maybe this system or with b5 the archangel b5 and bishop c5 and basically i i know this game because this is a game i i I, I kind of play myself it basically means meant to me or suggested to me like he doesn't really have uh, a super comfortable system against e4 and uh, I felt this because I'm kind of in the, in the same boat you know sometimes I play Taimon of Sicilian in the last game I played Sveshnikov you know I'll play e4 e5 occasionally I'll play e4 knight c6 sometimes <laughs> you know I'll play different versions of e5 myself and so I kind of get it it's like there's no perfect system you really like so you kind of end up bouncing uh, around quite a bit so for me it felt like Okay, maybe he's not so comfortable against e4, whereas against d4, I think he had been, I think also kind of switching it up, but it feel, felt like he was uh, much more solid and had a lot, a lot more solid options here. Um, so, yeah, we end up getting uh, a knight orf with h3. He goes e6, and I saw some games already where he went for the setup with g4 and uh, h6. And um, yeah, I was definitely very much looking forward to, to playing against this one because I feel like why well, just get to great play in these types of positions. And I mean, personally for me, like e5 and h5 kind of seems like the critical line. It's not that easy for black to play, but I think uh, objectively black is doing you know quite well here. And this is how I think a lot of the, the pros play it. Um, but seeing that he didn't really go for this one, it, yeah, it made it very tempting to uh, to play for for this kind of attack. Um, yeah, so here I played a3, and uh, this actually yeah very interesting move, and it was really really fun for me to watch David's and Jesse's uh, live commentary on this game uh, afterwards, and. Uh, yeah, you know, they had a lot of really interesting things to say. I really enjoyed watching them <laughs> go through it. Um, and yeah, I actually still believe this is a very, very interesting move. Um, so let's break it down. It's a very specific idea here. So I'll do my best to kind of uh, explain it as well as I can. Um, basically, white has a couple of different setups here. Um, but generally, Generally speaking, this bishop wants to go to e3. This bishop on f1 often wants to go to g2. White wants to play f4. Then put the queen somewhere, either queen d2 or queen e2, and castle queenside. That's kind of the ideal setup that white wants. Black has a couple of setups here as well. And this is really about the setup that black is choosing versus uh, white's move order. So a3 just becomes a very clever waiting move because it's a very useful move. Pretty much no matter what, black does and and what white does in response um, most natural move here is bishop to g2 and, and this has been the main line of the position for for quite some time uh, the issue with this one is when black plays bishop e7 bishop e3 and knight c6 so this is one of two setups 
that black can play. This is kind of the main setup with bishop e7 and knight c6. The other setup that black can't really get with bishop g2 is playing with, with b5. So also a serious option. And that's why bishop g2 is so tempting for white because it immediately stops the possibility of, of b5 here. But after bishop e7, bishop e3, knight c6, white kind of faces uh, an issue here because black wants to play knight e5, knight c4. So if white plays like queen d2, for example, then knight e5 is going to be pretty annoying. There's not really a good way to deal with this one. Queen e2 kind of comes with its, uh, its own drawbacks because then you're losing control over e4 and black can often play like takes, takes, e5, bishop e6, and just get a very comfortable position this way. So the critical move here has long been f4. And I'm pretty sure this is the position I gave in the Sicilian book um, as well. And yeah, everything would be great here for white because we're covering the e5 square, but the problem is black has this move knight d7 with the idea to go bishop h4 check, and this really just slows everything down in, in white's position. If white could just play queen d2 and castle queenside, then that would be great, but queen d2, bishop h4 check, white has to play bishop f2, black has to trade some pieces, and yeah, when I was preparing for this game, it seemed like uh, lately black was doing all right. In the past, I would think that white can still fight for an advantage here, but now I think it's not so easy. So, uh, I didn't come up with this move. This was actually, uh, I think, I don't know if it was first played, but I found this game by Caruana that he won against Grandmaster, I think it was Shigayev from Russia, uh, the Isle of Man Open. And yeah, if there's anything to know about Caruana, he's extremely well-prepared player. And uh, if he plays an idea, especially in like a big game like Isle of Man, you know that was a you know qualifier for the uh, for the Canada's tournament. <laughs> you know you can tell it's a pretty pretty serious idea. Um, yeah, and and his openings are definitely uh, worth taking a look at. Of course, he, you know he won the game. Like it was a very very impressive game. So the point behind this one is White is leaving the bishop on f1 and waiting for black to choose a setup. So if black goes for this bishop e7 and knight c6 setup, as we just saw in uh, this other line, this is a much better version for white. In fact, rook g1 is a nice move, and here white's playing queen d2, castling queenside, and not having to worry about knight e5, not having to worry about bishop h4 check, and basically getting the best possible version of this kind of, uh, let's say, call it Karras English, like a Karras attack. Um, so, and in these positions, it's very important that the bishop is actually better on f1 to cover the c4 square. Okay, now this move a3 also gives black the option to play uh, b5. So you might ask, like, why not just start with bishop e3 here? Why play a3? Why not just play bishop e3? So I think this is a very natural question, and just leave the bishop on f1. Uh, here the problem is b5. And the black can just go for this plan of playing bishop b7 and going after the e pawn. And here white actually doesn't want the bishop on e3 because now it's harder to defend the e4 pawn. Well, what I would like to do here is to play bishop g2 and queen e2 and defend this one, but now it's not going to be so easy. So here white has to play a3 anyway, otherwise b4 is going to be a big problem. Bishop b7, bishop g2, knight d7, the knight comes out to c5. And uh, yeah, if white could play queen e2 and leave the bishop on c1, the e pawn would be very easily defended. But here the bishop on e3 is actually kind of in the way. So bishop e3 is inaccurate because you don't necessarily want this one here uh, so early. Bishop g2 also comes with some drawbacks. a3 is a move that gets played in either position. <laughs> Ends up being a very, very useful move. Because um, sometimes black also wants to play d5, for example, and here a3 is useful because uh, it doesn't allow black to play any kind of uh, bishop b4. So bishop g2, um, I already mentioned the drawback is that the bishop doesn't cover the c4 square, and so this plan of bishop e7, knight c6, knight e5 simply gains in strength and hard for white to uh, to stop this one in, in in the long term in these kinds of positions. So, so bishop can actually be better placed on f1. So a3, and um, if black were to go b5 here, then yeah, white doesn't put the bishop on e3, 
Um, there's actually a number of interesting options here, like bishop g2 is possible. I think this move queen e2 is very interesting. And then after bishop b7, bishop g2, bishop d2, queenside castling, I think gives white like a healthy attack. h4 here is also, uh, seems like a very, very interesting idea and just playing for uh, for g5. Of course, it has to be uh, uh, prepared still with rook to g1, but rook g1, g5, and yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty dangerous looking attack to, to my eyes. Okay, so in the game a3, black play bishop e7, which uh, I think is the most logical move. And uh, now car want to play bishop e3 here. I I'm still following that game. And here is kind of the really nice uh, nice trick that white has up their sleeves. If black were to play b5 now, now that the bishop has committed to e3, and uh, this bishop can maybe go to b7, uh, here white has this very nice shot, e5. And... Uh, this is another kind of like, let's say, little devious point of a3, is that now this tactic is actually winning for white. So, or at least leading to a very nice position. d takes e5, the point is bishop to g2, and the rook on a8 is, is caught. So, without this move a3 included, if black were to, let's say, take here, white goes queen takes d4, let's say trade, trade. Without a3, bishop e7 included, then black would have this move b4. And, and then it would be very messy because, well, white's already down a piece. If white takes the rook, white's going to be down two pieces. And that would kind of save black. So let me just put that position on the board. Because you might ask, why not bishop e3, b5, e5, uh, like this? And so that there would be the problem. After takes, 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 I think black can go b4 first as well, but this one essentially saves. So this is kind of like a okay, small tactical point behind the scenes, but pretty important because otherwise b5, bishop to b7. Um, here black would just be getting a very nice uh, nice setup. Um, but this one is, and I mean, there's some deeper tactics involved here too. It's not like the easiest, <laughs> the easiest position. Um, for example, in case of um, e4 here, which I think is pretty natural. White can go knight takes e4, and let's say knight to d5. Feels like actually it's kind of reasonable for black, especially if they can stabilize. Um, but then white has this like incredible shot, knight f5. And there's some, some nice points here. If e f5, then knight d6 check is the idea. And white is currently down two knights, but wins the knight back. And in the end, once again, this rook on a8 is just always getting caught with these with these two bishops. So white is ending up with uh, extra exchange here. Um, or if knight takes e3, then white can throw a knight d6 check, and then uh, recapture on e3, and rook is still hanging. And okay, yeah, black's king is in uh, in huge danger. So. This is kind of like the, the tactical point in the game, black play knight c6, which I think is, uh, yeah, pretty natural, rook to g1. And, uh, okay, this move is definitely very, I would say, ambitious, but it's basically just following white's, white's plan, which is to go h4, g5. Of course, I want to go queen d2, possibly queen e2, and uh, in castle queenside here. And, uh, yeah, so the prep ended up, working out great because at this point we're still following the Caruana game and black has lots of different options here but essentially I just felt like white is getting exactly the the Karis attack uh, that we wanted and in this position it doesn't feel like a3 is such a useful move for white but yeah it really doesn't matter because the setup we got is uh, is absolutely perfect and now we're going to be able to castle queenside and uh, just launch a huge attack so knight d7 um, this was actually played in the in the stem game uh, bishop e2, and here white is kind of anticipating knight e5 to eventually uh, play f4. It's also important that, um, for example, if queen d2, knight e5, you know, white has to be very careful about knight takes d4, knight f3 ideas. So the bishop is really needed on e2 to control this knight. Uh, knight d5 was played. In the original game, black actually played g5 in this position which uh, is a very logical try, very thematic for the knight or to kind of secure the e5 square, not let white uh, play f4. And it wasn't like a perfect game, but the setup that Caruana chose with queen d2, castling h4, uh, it felt very, 
very effective. And yeah, white already had just a big, big advantage here. Um, so yeah, it actually analyzed this game a little bit. I didn't like remember it perfectly during the game. I just kind of looked at the setup that, that he chose and analyzed, you know, what might have happened on, on different tries. But okay, I basically stopped around here and felt like, yeah, white has a very, very nice position. Um, because g5 pawn is a big target and white's king is always going to be a little bit safer and, and so on. Um, in this game, black goes knight d5 right away. I went queen d2. And uh, and then he goes g5 here. <laughs> so it actually ends up not exactly transposing because in the Caruana game, his opponent played knight c5. Um, so here a different knight goes to e5, but essentially we get pretty much the same flavor of position. Um, so I, I spent some time, but I decided to just follow the plan, castle's queen side. Bishop d7, I played h4 here, rook g8, takes, takes, rook h1, and uh, yeah, I'm just kind of doing the same exact thing, just playing for like rook h5, maybe doubling rooks on the h file, maybe knight b3 at some point, maybe king b1. You know, white has a lot of moves to kind of improve their position and slowly try to uh, put pressure. Uh, and here black played queen to c7. So my first thought was definitely rook h5, and then I felt like probably at this point black is going to trade on d4 and castle queen side because okay this felt like the most the most logical just try to get the king out of uh, out of the center g5 pawn is still defended for the time being and you know maybe black can can draw up some counterplay somewhere i think this position would be fine for white like queen e3 for example is is a nice move and i think white is definitely doing very very well but uh i didn't necessarily want to trade these knights and i remember from analyzing the caruana game that at a certain point it would have been better to play knight to b3 and, and avoid the trade. Um, so then I started considering this move. And uh, I definitely like this one as well, just kind of keeping the pieces on the board and um, going for rook h5. And then at a certain moment, once I started considering like moving this knight somewhere, I think I might have considered knight b5 for a brief period. Um, I also realized like knight f5 actually is kind of a very tempting option as well. Uh, with the idea that if black goes ef5, then second knight comes into d5, and that knight on d5 is just a super, super strong piece. And I can then recapture on f5, and I'm getting a pawn to f5, maybe f6, and looks like black's king is just kind of stuck in the center. And at this point, it's funny, I was actually, I was kind of annoyed at myself for noticing that this was possible, because I already felt like you know, rook h5 is good, knight b3 is good, now I'm noticing a third option that like you know, I have to consider. Once you notice it, it's like I have a, you know, Hippocratic oath, right, to consider all good moves <laughs> in the position if I if I see something. So I was like, oh man, that looks kind of interesting. And yeah, I started analyzing it and started looking um, stronger and stronger um, because it it felt like well, the key point was after knight f5 takes, I just put it on the board, knight d5, um, black's queen has to find uh, a square and it's really not easy because if queen d8 then of course you're running into bishop b6 if queen c8 then you're always you know maybe a little bit worried about knight b6 which might not be a big deal but but still queen v8 okay then it just feels like the queen is just completely sidelined and the rook is sidelined of course black is not castling anymore and uh queen a5 of course this is really the critical move if if black could play this move then of course the the whole idea wouldn't really work Problem, of course, is that white is trading queens and getting knight c7 check at the end. And, uh, okay, black can try king to d8, but knight takes a8, white's up the exchange, and the knight is coming out. Here, king on d8 is even worse because of bishop b6 check ideas as well. So if white's just up the exchange in this endgame, then, okay, it's just a bad endgame for, for black, right? And totally, you know, uh, good reason to go for the sacrifice. So king f8, I remember thinking was better. But anyway, white takes the rook here, the knight can come out. Um, if something like f4, you know, we have bishop b6, bishop d4. Black really just doesn't have enough enough compensation for, for the exchange. Uh, I think f4 might be the best try, taking this pawn and hitting g4, and then, okay, white has to find rook hg1 just to make sure this pawn is defended, keeping the rook pressuring the, the d file, and yeah, white has a big advantage. So once I realized that queen a5 wasn't working, 
then I, I started to get excited because I felt like, oh, actually, this is this is going to be a very strong sacrifice. And um, yeah, after a little bit of thought, maybe five ten minutes, I do I do end up playing this one just because I. I didn't, didn't see a reason not to. It's also very nice when your sacrifice has to be accepted, because of course here I'm threatening to take the very important Dark Square Bishop, I'm threatening the d6 pawn, you know, this one's going to be hanging like, everything is collapsing for black if they don't accept the knight. So uh, black took knight d5, and uh, he ended up playing queen to b8 here. And actually the plan was to just decide, because I knew he was going to choose between one of these three moves. Queen a5 was also possible, but I was, you know, kind of done analyzing with that one. I just take the exchange and we'll try to convert. And I just decided, okay, like, if he chooses one of these three, then <laughs> then I'll figure it out from, from there. Because um, we have a, a lot of options from White's point of view. He ended up playing queen to b8. And yeah, I think the first move I considered when I was calculating the sacrifice was e takes f5. And this looked just very, very good to me. Like, Black's pieces just have, like, very few moves, like, no good squares, we have f6 coming, and we can just like slowly like open up the position and just bring the pieces in. You know, the king is stuck in the center, rooks are disconnected. There's just tons and tons of compensation. Um, and it looked completely winning. Then I realized g takes f5 is actually probably even stronger. <laughs> because here not only we get like the extra g file that we can open up, and you can imagine going rook g1, f4, and just the rooks made on uh, the back rank. And we also open up the bishop to maybe come in via the h5 square, which I thought could be useful in, in some lines um, as well. Uh, then, I don't remember exactly when I noticed this one, but I think after I saw gf and that this idea is is quite strong, I think somewhere I realized that like actually I have some, some back rank tactics as well. So on my opponent's turn, I started calculating um, the possibility of going bishop takes g5. I think I had already seen this one where I, when I had played knight f5, but I wasn't sure if I was going to play it or not. I was just going to decide later. Um, but yeah, I realized that this one is also extremely powerful as well. So the main idea here being that after bishop takes g5, we're going queen takes. And we've got the, the back rank check. And uh, our back rank mate. <laughs> and Frick takes g5. And then we have this one. Very important. Not queen takes g5, bishop takes g5 check. But rick h8 check and then... Okay, black has to play here, queen takes g5, and it's it's all over. So with bishop takes g5, it's kind of messier. Like, this would have looked uh, just really nice. And in blitz, I think I would just play this one, because it's just so easy. It's just something you play with your hand, and then you, you still have all of the threats in the position and just total control. Um, but concretely, I just felt like this was stronger, so I just and more direct, so I just ended up going for this one. Because um, now we're threatening to... Uh, take on e7, for example, and then go knight f6 check. We're threatening to just take this pawn as well. And, okay, black's king is in, in huge danger here. Uh, so bishop e6, definitely uh, a reasonable try. Here, white only has um, one way to win, but it's it's pretty straightforward, and we have to take on e7 with the knight, so keeping the dark square bishop uh, alive, which is going to be white's kind of strongest piece. So knight takes e7, and now e takes f5. GF5 was also uh, possible, but at this point I felt now EF5 seemed to be more effective to open up the E file in the long run and play for F4. And uh, I mean, we're down a piece, but it's just going to take so many moves for Black to develop here that they're, they're just not, not even close uh, to be in time. So if something like Bishop D7 here, then I think I'm just going to go F4 and then Queen E3 or Rook E1 and everything is collapsing. Um, in the game, Bishop d5 was played, and uh, again, white has a lot of good moves, but I think I just found the most direct. Bishop takes e7. If king takes, then queen takes d5. We have won our piece back. So bishop takes h1, but now bishop takes d6. At the moment, white is down a rook, but we're definitely winning back a piece at some point, and then we're just going to be down an exchange for like three pawns, so it wasn't too hard to calculate that, uh, you know, materially speaking, we're going to come out uh, ahead here. Uh, queen a7, queen d8 I thought was also possible, and then white can play rook takes h1. I think in the game I was going to play queen e3, which is maybe even stronger, and just, yeah, uh, threatening all kinds of stuff here. Um, but queen a7, I took on e5, bishop c6, bishop f6, just playing for mate now. 
queen b6, and uh, now bishop c4. Somehow I missed this queen d6 move, which <laughs> would have just ended the game on the spot. I don't know. I just wasn't looking in that direction. Uh, to, to me, this looks strong with like rook e1 and queen h6 and stuff coming. Um, though it does allow black to play rook takes g4, which um, does cover the, uh, the e4 square. But okay, now I play queen d6, rook e4, rook g1, and the rook is included. And yeah, this was time to resign for black is okay just getting made in so yeah overall uh i was super happy with this game honestly i felt like it was a uh, flawless game like some games you win and, and there you feel like there's always things you can criticize but here like there's really not one move uh not one move i i would change in this game uh which was which was pretty cool because i'm not usually an e4 player Right, so it felt <laughs> felt good to play. I don't have a ton of these like nice attacking games, and uh, yeah, I was definitely feeling like this would have this would go in my in my best games collection if I had to make one, um, including this move a three. Absolutely phenomenal <laughs> opening idea.